Uh, hello, I'm Philip Lope uh, from the Selection Committee of the New York Film Festival, and to my right is the director, Jimmy Miller, and next to him is Dr. Philip Seymour Hoffman. Uh, so uh, why don't I open it up directly to questions and comments from the audience. Uh, the question is to Mr. Hoffman, how you worked on the uh, research and personality of uh, Truman Capote. Uh, it's, um, <clears throat> it's a hard question to answer. It's, um, uh, one of the more elusive people that you can imagine. Uh, uh, so trying to actually, you know, work on it was pretty elusive and kind of, um, uh, uh, it's like living in a state of self-criticism that's unbearable for a long period of time. But um, I just got all the materials I thought were appropriate. Uh, this is very specific. Uh, it's not a biopic in the sense that you're covering a man's life. You're really covering a certain section of his life, and the story is of utmost importance. And so I, I really tried to acquire the materials and talk to the people that were the people to talk to or watch the things I needed to watch or listen to what I needed to listen to based on that premise. And uh, and uh, um, pretty much forced myself to be alone in a room. Uh, every day for a couple hours and um, and start working on it, you know, and um, and uh, but I could only bear about an hour and a half of that because uh, it, you know I beat myself up so brutally by the end of an hour and a half I had to leave and get, get some air. Um, but the, the, what happened in that room is really a, a much longer uh, dinner discussion while naked by a, a pool or something. Um, <laughs> So, uh, but basically, that's you know what I what I did. Yes, um, I was curious, uh, to Mr. Miller, how you came up with the with the look of the film. Uh, period. Look of the photography. Well, <clears throat> what makes this an interesting story for the screen is that. Uh, so much of what it's about is, is never made explicit in the story. It's um, what's not being said. It's, 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 it's on the one hand a story about a guy you know, writing his masterpiece, and on the other hand, he is uh, you know, having a very private tragedy. And I think Phil is charged with a very difficult task of expressing things in the way people express things in Berkeley and everything else. And, what it called for was a, was a prose approach to filmmaking, which is, had great austerity that had a quality of sensitizing you uh, deeply to the, the subtlest things that were happening within the performance and within the story. And uh, what once a commitment to a sort of prose, austere style, meaning using a simple visual vocabulary, kind of plainness to find poetry and power in, in, in really the plain and the simple. Uh, everything else kind of falls into place. And the other answer is what Truman Capote would say is that style is, is just, it's, it's what you have, it's like the color of your eyes, you know. Um, you know this, there's, a, I think, a good deal of it is just my natural uh, preferences. Yes. A question to the writer and to the actor. Do you think that Mr. Capote and Mr. and, and Perry were actually capable of love, given the similarity of their backgrounds? Actually capable of love, given the similarity of backgrounds. Um, well, love comes in, I, I mean, my answer to that, I think that love is, is, is a, comes in many different guises. Um, uh, and I think the debate has been, you know, what kind of love did they share, you know, and um, and I think there was this identification they had because of their similar backgrounds of being, you know, uh, abandoned uh, as children in different ways, but ultimately abandoned and living a somewhat of an orphaned life and, and uh, being on the outside. Kind of looking in, um, but I do think that that 
that there's that's more of a identification, more of a kind of an obsession. I think it comes out of that because of this, the interest in self. You know what I mean? That you see yourself in someone else that's so different from you, and that that captivates you, and you want to know why that is, and all those things. Um, but then I think what happens because of what he, you know, that combined with what he needs to do, which is he needs to ultimately get this man to open up. Intimacy happens, you know, because Capote encourages it. I think, you know, and no one knew at that time how long it would go on for. And then you're talking about many years of somebody really keeping the channel open and keeping that kind of, you know, that intimacy and that back and forth, whether it's through letters or physical contact or whatever. And I think that the byproduct of that, I think, is love of some sort, you know. Now it could be anyone's guess, and I think that movie kind of leaves it open to debate about what love they share. But it was one that I, you know, I think caused extraordinary grief for Capote after the execution. Uh, and that's what was so difficult, because the other thing was this need for them to die, and this kind of very self-centered thing that was happening to him at the time. But those things I did do think were working in concert, that his death would also bring up my, you know, uh, extreme amount of grief. Did you want to say anything about that? Um, well, I will. I will say you addressed it to the actor and the writer that, that I'm not the writer. That yeah, the writer Dan Futterman is uh, in Los Angeles today. Um, well, I, I, I again like you know, I think love is one of these terms that sort of has been made mediocre with time because it just means so many things. But I think both of these guys are enormously sensitive and capable of, of really feeling the spectrum, but. They're also diseased, and uh, you know, I think it's the commingling of, especially Capote's uh, sort of diseased ambition uh, with his sincere feelings. When Capote was asked, only months after the book was published, how to explain this intense relationship he took with with Perry Smith, he answered that it had something to do with Perry's total loneliness and uh, and his feelings of pity and sympathy for him. I, I really do think that uh, Capote uh, had the deepest uh, care and sympathy for him when he met him. Yes. Um, one phenomenon that's getting a lot of contemporary phenomenon that's seeing a lot of attention is the idea of red state versus blue state. And seeing as Capote was quintessentially New York character, how did how does um, that phenomenon, what were the implications of that 50 years ago, and how did you try to address that in this book? The question had to do with uh, the phenomenon of red state and blue state that seems that Capote is a New York uh, phenomenon, character going into uh, the other territory. Uh, I, I, I would say that uh, the film is deliberately not political and hopefully it aspires for something beyond politics. But having said that, he, it is a story of an outsider as much as he, uh, as much as he was the insider, a very successful socialite who knew everybody. Uh, the truth is that deep down he never saw himself that way. Uh, I'd also regard uh, Alvin Dewey as... as Put away your rotten fruit, uh, like the good kind of Republican. I don't know if they still exist, but you know, he, uh, <laughs> very, you know, these people had great decency. Uh, so I don't think he was stepping into a world. Um, of politics that has a direct correlation to the way we're perceiving that difference today. This idea of the um, of the writer sucking the blood of the characters was that your idea of Capone's or Well, I think it was somebody's idea way before any of us. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that's that's the, the, one of the major main themes of the you know not just the writer but the artist. You know, I, mean, I looked at this as the as an artist, not just a journalist or a writer. But what is the, you know what's the implications of art? Sometimes when you when you delve into this area. You know, and I think that uh, it's been bastardized into such a way where we're bombarded with this kind of thing 24-7 now almost, this exploitation of people. 
uh, and exploitation goes back to, you know, Goes back. It goes back to you know the history of civilization. The moment of society, the slaves. And, you know. Someone said, "Could you lift your right leg while I draw that on the wall?" You know what I mean? It's it's uh, that thing. Um, but specifically, it was Danny Futterman's idea for this project. Danny Futterman, you know, had this the screenwriter had this idea that the other great story of In Cold Blood was the writer actually writing it, and uh, and I agree with him. I think it's one of the great great tales. It's one of the, I, I just think it's one, a classic tragedy in the classic sense. It's inevitable the outcome will not be stopped, you know. Um, once he sees Perry Smith, it, it will go, it's a rock rolling downhill, you know. What was the amount of time from the time they were convicted to the time they were executed? They, they, they were convicted in January of 1960 and they hung in April of 65. You're talking about the lag now between, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, things are different. And interesting, something that we didn't get into in the film, is that um, Kansas was on the verge of, you know, suspending their capital punishment. And Smith and Hickok were the second to last people to be executed in that state before uh, there, was a, there was a stay of many years. Yes. A question of Mr. Hoffman. Uh, Jack Dunphy and Harper Lee have this with the triangle relationships on screen with, with Capote. How do you, in character, what did he get from them, and why did they love him? Why did they like him? Why did they love him? What? What did he, what, what does Drew Truman Capote get from Jack Dunphy and Harper Lee, and, and why do they love him? Um, well, again, that's one of the elusive kind of mysteries of his life. I mean, I, I looked a lot into that relationship, but I mean, the one story I remember is that they met one night and they were at a dinner party or friends invited them over. He met Jack Dunphy. They ended up spending the whole night together. No one knows what happened that night. And then they spent basically their lives together. You know, Jack Dunphy's an incredibly interesting guy. You know, he just come out of a marriage. And I think he was quite heartbroken from that marriage. Um, you know, there's all these very interesting things about Jack Dunphy um, and Harper Lee. I mean, they're vastly different from Truman. Um, I, I basically saw it as uh, a place where he could uh, not feel like he had to be on. And, um, and I think that was a refreshing and, and a, re uh, a respite for him because I do think he was compelled to be on. He was compelled to make an impact when he was anywhere. Because I do think that his main character flaw was that there was never enough love. And and that's an awful, I mean, I think we all have that a little bit inside of it, but I think his was exacerbated to a point of like a cancer, you know, and he just couldn't, and I think the story starts where it's exacerbated, but then you really see how it did, the wound gets completely pulled open by the end, you know that character flaw, but I think these two people, he never had to get, he never had to worry about that with them. They were there, and he knew they'd be there, and there was a, it was something about that that allowed him to actually bounce controversial things off them, have them say, what the fuck are you doing? And then he could still go on and do it anyway. You know, and there was something about that kind of trust, and that, that, those, those kinds of things is how I looked at their relationships. I, I, to me, that's a game. To me, that, that in, in that moment, it's, it's not, you know, I mean, you get into, the, you know, how complicated that, because she's a writer and she's going to come out with a book and everything. But I do also think it's him playing with his friend. You know what I mean? It, it's such a scale, you know, to make him, him look in this, a certain light. But you can see the minute she calls him on, that's the whole point, that he will do these things in front of Jack or Nell, and Nell and Jack will immediately be like, what are you doing? And it'll be like, oh, <laughs> you know what I mean? And that, that thing where with other people, I don't think he had that kind of freedom. That's, you know, the, the, the complicated thing, but I think that's the general way I've worked on it. I'm curious if I may ask a question about, about the, the end, the, the last title would suggest that there was a kind of cause or relationship between uh, their execution and his uh, not finishing another book. Uh, and you spoke about grief. Uh, um, is, is there any is there any evidence of this, or is this a kind of 
uh, uh, U.S. speculation that uh, that his um, that his inability. I mean, suppose he. Well, when when Capote's life was in ruins years later, and it was clear that he was down for the count. It's it's his own observation that he never recovered from the experience. Yeah. I mean, him, his friend, everybody around him too. But that that's his that's his observation too. And Joe Fox is reported as saying, I mean, Joe Fox is the one with him at the execution and saying that he basically cried uncontrollably the whole plane ride home while holding his hand. So just imagine being on a plane and you're seeing two grown, grown men holding hands and one is uncontrollably crying the whole way. You know, you rarely see that if ever, you know, and 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 one of them happened to be Truman Capote. So from that, I think, you know, it's pretty clear that something had happened. Well, it literally is a scar. I think it, it makes you tired. <laughs> um, I only leave a scar. What was I think the it question? Leaves, what? The question was, what was the deepest scar that this, uh, uh, that this hacking uh, in this film left, left with you? Uh, there's no scar that's left because I'm not him and, and, and I didn't have to live with that, that experience. But what happens is I think that in, in investigating someone you're playing, and someone like this especially, you are forced to forgive them. You're forced to justify and defend what they did. So there's a certain amount where you become their best friend almost, as you look at it, or you become the, the best defensive attorney they could find, you know? And in doing that, your own self-criticism becomes heightened. Because the more you find out about someone else, the more you're looking at yourself. You see what I mean? And so, like, it's like those two things start to take place. And with him, it was it was a, a lot of that. It's like a lot of looking at my, a lot of what I know about what he did, you know, in my own. And so that's kind of you know exhausting, you know, and that's kind of a, a self reflection that is uh, not always pleasant, you know. Um, but it was necessary because ultimately, you know, this story leads to the moment of the ultimate self-reflection that he has when he says goodbye to them in that room, you know, that I really do think that, you know, artistically and dramatically for the story that the minute he, he knows something will happen, the minute he sees them, that it's this, this self-reflection, the self-criticism that is like a, a mountain that just crushes him that he, and he can't get out of the way of it. And I do think that was the damage was caused in that moment, you know, and almost like it almost seared itself onto his spirit or onto his brain. I know I'm sounding very kind of uh, dramatic about it, but I do look at it like that, you know. And so when you're looking at playing something like that, you have to kind of answer very personal questions about yourself. So that can be tiring, but it doesn't leave any scar. It just I think makes you more self-aware, which can be a good thing, but also you know not. Have you read his books? And told Vladimir No, I, just, I didn't read anything. No, I didn't. Uh, yeah, I did. <laughs> I, uh, I decided not to. I decided to read on. Um, no, yeah, yeah. I did. Actually, but I wasn't. I wasn't well read. I wasn't well read on Capote when they gave me the script. So it was. Yeah, I had to read a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was just for uh, Mr. Miller. I, I was kind of curious. Um, Besides working with actors, is there anything that you personally like better about uh, narrative filmmaking than documentary filmmaking? What makes you think working with actors is fun? <laughs> Question is, is there anything you like better about narrative filmmaking rather than uh, documentary filmmaking? Oh, I, I really like crafting things, I really like controlling things, and every frame and moment of this film, like visually and sound, is, is really crafted. Uh, there's a certain amount of craft in documentary, but you know, the level of control here is at once a curse, but also very satisfying. Is it grief or guilt is the question? Oh yeah, I mean uh, that's what I was. That's what I mean. it's a hard thing. That's why I say it's really hard to talk about because it's elusive. Because I think everything's elusive in the story because there's so many things happening at once, and that was what was so important to get. You know that he, I think he was quite genuine most of the time of his feelings toward Perry and all these things. But I think he also had this plan that was dictated by ambition and all these other things that are pretty obvious. 
And I think when he gets there, it's the same feelings, you know, grief, abandonment, loss, guilt, shame, resentment. I mean, on and on and on. I mean, all those things. But I do think all the biggest thing is this moment of reflection. That I do think he's, he is a self-critical, reflective thing that has to happen in order for somebody to, you know, have the damage to kind of unfold. Or I think, or I, or I think he would have pr pr proceeded through his life uh, more prolific than he did. But the actual line he says is, I did all I could, which is a very subcritical line. Yeah, because that's the best thing he had to say, because he obviously didn't do all he could. That was the whole point. He, uh, You know, you see him write that letter. It's like he didn't make a bunch of calls before he wrote that letter. He just wrote that letter. You know, and you see him at the premiere, and he's just like, what are these people, like the state of Kansas is, you know, causing him pain or something. You know, uh, I mean, it's very clear where he is at that juncture. So him saying that is the best he has to say to them, and it's a lie. I mean, even his last thing he's saying as he's feeling these things is a lie. You know, and that's to me like, you know, as he's going through all these things we're just talking about, he lies again. But he could could be construed as I did all I could given who I am. Well, I'm sure he justified it, though. <laughs> he was pretty good at that. Yes, in the back. With, with, with most of the film, there was, there was a very sincere and strong effort to uh, portray people accurately you know, in the period and everything else. Th that character had a particular narrative demand on him, and I will confess that liberties were taken, and he represents more than William Shawn. Uh, he also represents Joe Fox, he also represents you know, the sort of need that the story had. So uh, liberties were taken with, with that character for sure, and, 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 and truth be told, cannot be considered historically completely accurate. Thinking about the variety of roles and how do you immerse yourself differently and uh, is, uh, go ahead, answer it any way you want. Yeah, no, it's a, you know, uh, well the difference with this role is the fact that there's a lot of work to be done before you can really interact with other actors in a way that will be beneficial. I guess, is, you know, so that's why it's like, you know, I just needed to go and be in a room alone for a long time to kind of work on certain things so when I did start rehearsing or acting with the people I had the facility to actually, you know, give and take with them. Uh, whereas other parts don't need that sometimes. Sometimes you can re you're, not, you're not worried about a certain technical aspect of playing the part, so you can kind of delve in. But you know, I just think as an actor, it's good to explore a lot of different challenges, you know? Um, and I, cause I do think, you know, I know, it's, you know not everyone thinks this is kind of, but I do think acting's an art form. And I do think there's a lot of different ways you can challenge yourself and look at it. And this is one of them, and then other parts don't need that. And some are easier and some are harder. But um, but with this one, I knew I needed to spend a lot of time doing certain kind of work before I could kind of get together with everybody. Yeah. The character in Flawless, how did that relate to the character development of the movie? <laughs> Uh, yeah, they had a relationship. Um, <laughs> very interesting. Uh, no, um, it's a similar thing. I mean, uh, relate. I mean, I haven't really thought about how they relate. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't, don't it, it didn't really, you know, interest me so much. But uh, working on them at a certain similar thing, you know, the, a technical thing, is things that need to be taken care of before I could interact in a way that would be helpful. What was your attraction to this story? Did it cause any self-reflection about the work you're doing? And she's comparing it to uh, Capote's being drawn to this. Um, I made a documentary about a person which uh, allowed me to identify a little bit before, but... Uh, I don't know how to answer that. People, 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 uh, people want things from other people, uh, both in an artistic relationship, but just in life in general. And it's not always possible to be honest about it. And. Um, I'll say this, 
making a film of wood, directing a film requires a, a lot of aggression. I think maybe more aggression than feels comfortable sometimes. You know? uh, but you know, you fix yourself on a goal and what you want, and um, you might find yourself a slightly different person. You know, the, you know what you're willing to do to get what you want. <laughs> And I think that's probably true of any of anybody, almost anything. Uh, but once we were told we had the money to make this film, I think Phil feels like this too. We we entered into a crisis because of the degree of difficulty of it, because of the time and money that was available to us, which was, I think, by all reasonable standards, not enough. Um, and it's a, it's a painful state to be in for a year and a half of, of crisis and desire and things have to be just so. Also, the, the style of the film is very unforgiving style. And, uh, you know, at, at some point you just stop excusing yourself, I think, you know, and, and just say, fuck it, like, this is how it has to go. And I'm sorry that your leg has to be amputated for it. <laughs> Thanks very much.